Hello and welcome to TerraPhysica channel. We have already released several videos dedicated to quantum mechanics in various ways, and in many of these videos I had to maneuver around the concept of spin, which we hadn't discussed or explained before. I've decided to rectify this gap, and today we are delving into what spin is, why it is essential, and its profound significance in physics. Furthermore, in the comments section of the previous videos, Many viewers expressed irritation regarding the use of artificial intelligence for narration. Well, then I will attempt to voice the videos with my own voice, and hopefully my Russian accent will be more pleasant for you. Please do share your thoughts in the comments, letting me know which of two options you prefer. Alright, remember to subscribe to the channel, and let's dive in and unravel the mystery of spin. In a nutshell, spin is the intrinsic angular momentum possessed by any quantum particle whether it's an electron, proton, neutron, or anything else. The concept of angular momentum is introduced in classical mechanics to describe the amount of rotation of a mechanical system, analogous to linear momentum, which quantifies the translational motion. Importantly, various factors can lead a particle to possess different types of angular momentum. For instance, protons in a Large Hadron Collider whistling around its rings at near light speeds acquire a certain angular momentum. Electrons within an atom also have angular momentum, previously explained by their orbiting motion around the atomic nucleus in the planetary atomic model. The angular momentum is known as orbital momentum. Nowadays we don't describe electrons in atoms as orbiting around the nucleus, and we don't delve into their exact motion or if they even move at all. We simply state that they are somehow distributed within regions called orbitals, where the size and shape of these regions depend on the energy of the electron. As it turns out, due to their location on a specific orbital, electrons possess the angular momentum, which, by the way, can be zero for inner so-called S orbitals, accommodating the first two electrons on each energy level. Moreover, particles possess intrinsic angular momentum, initially attributed to their rotation around their own axis, and this is what called spin. So every spin is angular momentum, but not all angular momentum is spin. However, this similar to the case of the orbital angular momentum of electrons in an atom, the rotation in the classical sense doesn't really apply here. An electron cannot rotate around its axis just because it's currently regarded as having no linear dimensions. In simpler terms, it's a point, and the point cannot spin around itself. Although we are not entirely certain that an electron has absolutely no dimensions, its size is too minuscule for us to sense even in the most precise experiments. It's definitely smaller than 10 to the power of minus 18 meters. To impart the observed spin values to an electron by rotating such a tiny object at the required rate around its axis, the rotation speed would need to be thousands of times faster than the speed of light, which is impossible. Therefore, in modern physics we don't associate the internal angular momentum of a particle, its spin, with any form of rotation. Spin just exists for a particle, and that's that. By the way, we often encounter similar situations in physics. In school, we learn that the regular momentum of an object is the product of its mass and velocity. However, for example, photons have zero mass, yet possess momentum. Another example. In classical mechanics, objects possess energy due to its motion and interaction with the other objects. However, in reality an object has energy even when at rest and without interacting with anything simply because it has mass according to the famous equation E equals mc squared. Given this, the fact that non-rotating quantum objects can possess internal angular momentum just because they exist isn't particularly unusual. So quantum particles possess an internal angular momentum known as spin, and the magnitude of this spin is a constant property unique to each type of particles. The spin remains the same for all electrons across the universe, and the intrinsic angular momentum of protons, neutrons, photons, and other particles are also equal among themselves. Thus, a particle's spin is its characteristics as its mass, electric charge, and so on. Now, let's understand that, like any angular momentum, spin is a vector quantity, defined not just by its magnitude, but also by its direction. For example, the macroscopic angular momentum of objects actually rotating is always perpendicular to the plane of rotation. 
Similarly, for quantum objects, spin always has a definite direction in space, and this direction can vary among different particles. How a particle behaves and interacts with other objects depends on the orientation of its spin. To fully describe the vector characteristics, including both its magnitude and direction, we can calculate or measure the projections of this quantity onto coordinate axis. The sum of the squares of these projections give us the absolute value, and by analyzing their relationships, we can determine the vector's direction. However, when it comes to spin, things work a bit differently. The projections of spin along different axes are subject to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the same principle that prevents us from precisely measuring both the position and momentum of a particle simultaneously. If we accurately determine one of these attributes, we lose precision in defining the other. The same goes for the spin projections. We can only know one of them simultaneously, profiting our ability to comment on the values of the other two. The choice of which axis to use for determining spin projection isn't fundamental. Usually, an axis perpendicular to the particle's motion plane is chosen, but in some cases, determining the spin projection in the direction of motion becomes important. This quantity is also known as helicity. Now, how does the projection of spin on our chosen axis change based on the particle's orientation? Clearly, if the absolute spin magnitude of a particle is a certain value yota, corresponding to a situation where a particle is oriented strictly against the chosen axis, 2 yota for particles oriented strictly along the axis. If we were dealing with a classical mechanics, the spin projection within this range could take any value. However, in the quantum world things work differently. Here physical quantities change discreetly, in quantized portions rather than continuously. It turns out that the projection of angular momentum can only change by an integer times the reduced Planck constant, which is the Planck constant divided by 2 pi. This fact was first discovered in 1922 in the famous Stan Gerlach experiment, which we'll delve into more in one of our upcoming videos. So the projection magnitude of a specific particle's spin must adhere to this inequality, where n is an integer, the number of units of Planck constant that make up our projection value. This yields specific requirements for the total spin value of particle. It can either be an integer times of Planck constant, 0, 1, 2 and so on for even n, or a half integer value, like 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves and so on for odd n. For instance, a particle with a spin of a half times the Planck constant can have two possible values for spin projection on an axis, minus half and a half times the Planck constant. For particle with a spin of one Planck constant, there are three possible projection values – minus 1, 0 and 1. Particles with a spin with a 3 halves times the Planck constant can have projections of minus 3 halves, minus half, 1 half and 3 halves times the Planck constant. Finally, the particle with a spin of 2 has a whopping 5 possible projection value – minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1 and 2 times the Planck constant. I'm sure you've already noticed, for particle with integer spins, the number of possible value of spin projection on an axis is always odd, while for the particles with half integer spins, it's always even. Now, here's the intriguing part. This fact actually makes the behavior of quantum particles with integer and half integer spins quite distinct from each other. So distinct that they have been classified into two different categories. Particles with integer spins are called bosons, and particles with half integer spins are called fermions. We'll delve into the difference between these particles in our next video. For now, let's identify fermions like protons, neutrons, electrons and neutrinos, all of which have a spin of a half times the Planck constant. On the other hand, bosons include photons, as well as gluons, the carriers of the strong nuclear force, and other particles. And of course we have the famous Higgs boson, which has a spin of zero. So let's sum up what we've considered so far. A particle's spin is its internal angular momentum, unrelated to its motions or interactions. Spin is measured in units of reduced Planck constant, multiplied by an integer or half integer number s, which remains consistent for all particles of the same kind, known as spin quantum number. However, we can never actually measure the total spin value. We can only measure one, but any chosen, projection of a spin on a selected axis. This projection value can range from minus s to s times to the Planck constant. 
in the increments of one Planck constant. It's a bit tricky because in popular science videos and sometimes even in scientific literature both the spin quantum number and the actual magnitude of an angular momentum and even the magnitude of its projection onto the nexus are sometimes referred to as spin. It's crucial not to get confused and to understand what's being referred to in each context. For instance, when talking about the difference in spin between two identical particles, the context usually refers to the projection of spin on an axis. On the other hand, when saying, for example, that the spin of a photon is 1, it's referring to the spin quantum number. Now let's touch on why having internal angular momentum or spin is crucial for quantum mechanics, nuclear physics and elementary particle physics. Firstly, thanks to spin, all charged particles possessed intrinsic magnetic moments, creating tiny elementary magnetic field. These fields facilitate interactions with other elementary particles and their complexes, such as atomic nuclei or whole atom, as well as with the external magnetic fields of macroscopic objects. One of the most astonishing results of spin-spin interaction, driven by the interactions of elementary particle spin magnetic fields, is the phenomenon of neutral hydrogen emission. The hydrogen atom's nucleus consists of a single proton, and it has only one electron. The quantum spin number of both these particles is half. This means that their spin projections can only take two values, minus half and a half. So there are only two possibilities. The spin of the proton in the nucleus and the electron in the electronic shell can either have the same sign or different signs, meaning that they can be aligned in the same directions or opposite directions. Interestingly, it turns out that when their spins are aligned, the atom's energy is slightly higher than when they are anti-aligned. Consequently, an energy transition can occur from a higher energy state with a parallel spins to a lower energy state with anti-parallel spins. This transition results in the emission of the excess energy in the form of a photon, a quantum of electromagnetic radiation. The wavelength of these radiations is 21 cm, which falls within the radio frequency range. This emission is known as 21 cm neutron hydrogen line, and due to the immense amount of hydrogen in the universe, it is the most common form of electromagnetic radiation in space. This common radiation is generated precisely because both the electron and the proton possess spin. However, apart from the magnetic properties that charged particles acquire due to their intrinsic angular momentum, spin still holds colossal significance. For instance, two identical particles, let's say two electrons in the same energy state, but with different spin projection values along an axis, will, according to quantum physics, still differ from each other. Identical electrons, which are fermions, particles with a half integer spins, are forbidden to occupy the same energy states within the same quantum system. This phenomenon is known as Pauli exclusion principle, and we'll explore its fundamental causes and consequences in our next video. As particles with different spin projection values are considered distinct, one orbital of an atom, for example, can hold up to two electrons. Moreover, it discovered that between two electrons in the same state with opposite spin projections, a peculiar force of attraction arises. This force plays a key role in interatomic interactions, leading to the formation of chemical reactions. Essentially, the entirety of chemistry as we know it stems from the fact that electrons possess a spin, and this spin is a half. In essence, discussing quantum mechanics and elementary particle physics without mentioning spin is like discussing painting without mentioning color. I hope that after this video you have a somewhat clearer understanding of what spin is and how it plays a role in the grand tapestry of physics.